Hello. <clears throat> I'm I'm here. I'm just eating cereal. Okay. <laughs> we we slept overnight in the California Academy of Sciences. <laughs> oh wow. Okay. <laughs> Which was kind of cool. Yeah. But, anyway. Very night at the museum sort of thing. Yes. Yes. We had a, a it, when they they called it uh, penguins and. Um, yes, uh, although no penguins were seen. Um, <laughs> That's great. Mm. Uh, yeah. So I don't know who's, I know that Amanda's not going to be here, and oh, okay. see, I'm not sure. Uh, they may have some people presenting, but I'm not sure if they're coming. So Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. Um, I, know it, it, I know it's... Spring break for some people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's that time of year. Welcome. Uh, so this week we had uh, the DVOR meeting, and uh, so that was uh, good. Actually, the I had to do a recap of it because the encoder failed on the recording. So but we did have two people present on their work. So one or two of the GSOC people, uh, they both have very interesting projects on uh, graph neural networks, one being hyper networks, and the other one being like a combination of uh, neural developmental programs, and um, I can't remember the other thing they're trying to combine in there. But uh, it would be very, I think they'd both be very good, uh, you know, advance kind of two different directions, but that's what we usually do. So um, I think that would be good for the project because the project is. You know, kind of poised to do something. Uh, we have we have our pipeline, and you know we just need to like kind of get to the uh, the right side of the pipeline instead of the left side, which we've been doing for the last couple of years. So we have a like a lot of image segmentation, and uh, you know that's that's useful in a wide a wide variety of contexts. And then we're trying to do the graph embeddings. And then you know take the graph embeddings and do something with them. So both of these projects are really kind of focused on taking graph embeddings and moving forward to something more substantial. So that'll be interesting to see. I like the uh, the papers that um, Jess put in Breitbart Vehicles Channel. Okay. <clears throat> or you know. Some agent-based modeling stuff that seemed seemed you know kind of re re relevant for deep web one. Yeah. Um, so that yeah, we, I think he mentioned that he wants to start mm -hmm. in on that again. So that's good, and we'll review those maybe in a little bit. Um, hello, Ajad. How are you? Hello. Hello. I'm good. Good. And Hope so, you guys are good. Yeah, yeah. And so we'll, we'll probably do that. We might also do a review of brain organoids because we haven't touched that in a long time. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it's like a lot of good no, stuff no. in it. I, I, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't had too much this week, but but happy to for yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, we I don't think we reviewed it in a long time. That's why I bring yeah. it up. <laughs> So yeah, that's good, and that's all the meetings we've had this week. We uh, haven't had a, a cognition futures meeting or a cybernetics meeting, and then we're still waiting on the open source meetings to start. We'll probably start uh, once the Google Summer of Code is announced. So we'll do that. Uh, okay. So, um, Ajad, how, how are you? Hello, uh, yeah, I'm good. Uh, I, I was, I didn't know if you wanted to present or if you wanted to wait or what, what was the... Uh, I, I, I'd like, I prefer to like present after some time because I'm like, still preparing a bit. Okay. Is that fine? Oh, that's fine, yeah. Okay, thanks. All right. So why don't we move into uh, the, the different channels here in the Slack. So this is something we haven't done in a while, but... We have our Slack and we have these channels that people post things in and they kind of have discussions that kind of go away. So I'd like to 
go back over some of them. <laughs> so we have brain organoids, which I'll get to, but I did want to actually get to um, Bradenburg vehicles as well. So this is, you know, there's a lot of good stuff in Bradenburg vehicles. This is something we haven't worked on in a while, like in terms of the research, because we've had, uh, you know, we, we have a paper on this, actually a couple papers and presentations where we, we've kind of taken Bradenburg vehicles in the developmental direction. And that is developing like little connectomes, developing embodied agents, and, you know, working from that point. And so why would we want to use Bradenburg vehicles? And it's because they're these very simple nervous systems, or at least that's how they were sold in the 80s. And then, you know, we can take those models and build from them. So, you know, we've done all sorts of things with them. They're interesting models. They, they kind of exhibit very basic behaviors. Uh, but this channel actually has a lot of stuff that's not limited to Bradenburg vehicles. There's stuff on large language I'm, models and so forth, right? Well, yeah, I, I've certainly used it as a, a bit of a, a, a dumping ground for, for robotics in general. Yeah. So, you know, like, like I'm, I'm happy to remove those to a... <laughs> oh, no, no. You know, it, 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 to keep it, but <clears throat> but you will you will see a lot of Ross robotics-related um, stuff in there, too. Yeah, no, I think this is that's a fine place for it because, okay. uh, you know, one of the main applications of Breitenberg vehicles is, is kind of in robotics. And we'll actually, when I, I presented to uh, uh, Embody Intelligence Workshop, one of the things that they, um, the, one of their interest areas is soft robotics. And so that's a very, uh, like, easy application domain. So I discussed a couple, had a, fielded a couple questions about that and had a dis yeah. little bit of a discussion on it, but we haven't done anything with our models in robotics, so it's mm -hmm. you know that's a future work, I guess. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, actually, there's this new book coming out. It's coming out probably next month, or in May, June, maybe. I don't know. They 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 always estimate a time where they're going to release it. So, but it's coming out in the next few months. This is the open dynamics of Breitenberg vehicles. So this is Scott Houghton and Jeff Yoshimi. Jeff Yoshimi, of course, is a philosopher and cognitive scientist who's interested in this stuff. Uh, you know, uh, like basically, he's, he's uh, built a program where you can simulate small connectomes or small uh, uh, like connectionist networks. He's done other things. They're actually, in this book, they're going to be analyzing Hardenberg vehicles. Actually, took some stuff that they had posted on um, Mastodon about like some of the stuff they're doing with uh, geom complex geometries. So it's really interesting stuff and, and it kind of relates to some of the stuff we, we talked about in our paper, the artificial life paper on developmental Bradenburg vehicles. So this will be something to get and, and to go through when it comes out. Um, yeah, I mean, this is like, again, this uh, naturalistic sort of behavior and agents where you train the agents and they don't just, you know, they kind of have this naturalistic aspect to it. There's movement, there's embodiment, there's this connectome that you can explore and so forth. Um, so then, you know, there are a lot of th good things on robotics here. There's this robotics developer masterclass. Um, yeah, <clears throat> so that's that's a great that, that's a great YouTube channel. I mean, they make all their materials available. <clears throat> yeah, and it, I think it's one of those those kind of courses where they they do uh, a paid course, but they also make all their uh, material available. So you can kind of do it for a certificate, or you can you know just go through the material yourself if you want. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, then there's uh, this talk, uh, learning structured world models for, from and for physical interactions. This is a talk, uh, I guess it's in coming to UIUC as a professor. Um, and this, I, I don't know if you have anything to say about this. Yeah, well, <clears throat> it, it related to the, um, the, the Saffron R, R, you know, Royal Society yeah. Um, kind of um, special issue uh, that um, 
that, that uh, yeah, it was it, it, it was interesting in terms of the, the um, greater context for the the kind of world model papers that that he cited there, and um, I think I dropped in some uh, uh, other talks that um, that maybe even specifically went over those particular papers, but um, yeah. Yeah. So that's a YouTube video. Um, let's see. There's the Michigan Mars Rover team homepage. M Rover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There was an event going on with like teams from, you know, like eight to 12 teams. <clears throat> and this was just one of them. Um, um, you, you know, but this is uh, very much like the um, wasn't it a, like a DARPA challenge like ten years ago or something maybe even longer probably it, it, anyway but just just um, <clears throat> there's a Silicon Valley Robotics Club and um, and a couple of uh, I forget what the one is that's over in um, not Rutherford Livermore uh, anyway they've they've got um, you know, this was an old challenge where to to cover you know rough terrain, and um, and I forget what the what kind of challenges they added to it. But um, um, you know, fifteen years ago, there was like only one team, you know, had a design that that made it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now now you see, you know, it's basically become a kind of like an undergrad project, you know. Yeah, um, it's, it's interesting to see the progress and and to see what the kind of what projects and libraries that um, teams are sharing at this point. <clears throat> yeah, that's interesting. How like something can be a grand challenge at one right. point in time, and then it becomes like the standard thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it actually, you know, I think like my my neuroimaging advisor, like his first project was like getting a getting a car. You know, they were actually using a car as the rover. Yeah, yeah. You know, and just controlling the steering wheel. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, anyway. Yeah. It's so, you know, and that would have been like the nineties. Yeah. Know. There's the multi-agent learning seminar. Now this one has this this link works. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, good. And um, you know, somewhat. Um, well, just you know, multi-agent. <clears throat> you know, like like agent-based modeling has you know uh, a lot more complexity and a lot more. Um, um, you know the the parallels that you see with the agent based modeling in terms of you know modeling economic systems you know um, war and the kinds of things that you see in the Joshua Epstein stuff anyway but this yeah. is just yeah um, they they put all their videos up and you know I, I forget if this is one where you if you fill you know like you can actually um, join their Zoom um, yeah. if you want to ask questions and stuff. Yeah, or their Slack maybe. Yeah, I forget on this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, people still like to put like naked Zoom links up on the web, and like that's probably not great. <laughs> so I don't know. we don't want people going. In yeah, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, anyways, yeah, that's so that's that, and then. There's this uh, article here. Can large language models reason and plan? So this mm. is yeah, and th I think this is after um, Sarah presented. Oh, oh, right. Because she she was she was talking about using LLMs as uh, as agents, right? And um, uh, it, it, it you know, and it's definitely a thing, right? So right. Um, well, at this point, L <laughs> you know, LLMs and, you know, X. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I, I thought this was, this was a, an interesting take on it. And again, just, 
going through not how much does it work, but you know, what are the ways in which it fails? Yeah. So is this a paper? Because there's like a one sentence abstract here. Yeah. I guess there's Did a you? paper. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Um, and then see, so yeah, this, this, okay. Wow. Version appears in the annals of the New York Academy of Sciences here. And then this is, uh, kind of going through system one and system two type, uh, cognition and then LLM. So the difference here, I guess, is that in, you know, in human cognition, I guess we have system one, which is reflexive knowledge mm -hmm. and then system two, which is deliberate knowledge. And so system one is kind of like a, Bradenburg vehicle thing uh, that, that we, we can famously characterize and then system two is like more uh, reflect or, or you know like more what we would think of as cognition maybe and then there's evolution environment then with LLMs you just have this reflexive knowledge you have pre-training you have fine-tuning and you have um, a model that you put in so this is kind of the difference I guess the I guess there are all parallels between system one and LLM, but the difference here is that LLMs have you know they require a lot of pre training as, as opposed to just being able to interact with the environment. Now we can argue whether you actually need pre training for cognition, at least not the way that it's thought of in machine learning, but like that you need some basic information to interact with the world, but. Yeah, this is the difference here. And so, you know, it's nice to lay things out like that. Um, but yeah, this is kind of an informal paper, I guess. Um, but yeah, they, they kind of, yeah, this is impressive reasoning abilities of LLM is the castle. And there's this little brick here that's the prompter knowing the answer. This is this classic um, X, uh, XKCD meme where you. It's like you can collapse this whole castle by pulling out this block here. You know, it can be brittle. So, yeah, there are a lot of, I guess, caveats to that kind of a model. Oh, the Sebastian Risi stuff. So that's the neural developmental programs. This is actually a talk on growing adaptive and self-assembling machines. So this is basically a network. So that that's that's something that you know. Yeah, because that was the the paper that Sarah. Um, that was one of the the references that she had. Okay. Um, uh, was was you know Reese was like last author. Yeah. yeah. Right. This is path to AGI. Uh, oh, Nvidia announces Moonshot to create yeah, embodied that, human level AI in robot form. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the Buzz Robot. Um, the, the talk before like um, is a Bay Area group, and um, what was the name of that? Um, anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Oh yeah, I mean this is just the the paper where there there's this Nvidia's Groot, which is this general purpose humanoid robot, and so you know. Uh, that that's what they're trying to do. So there is this, you know, the big dog from Boston Dynamics. Some of these other attempts at building uh, robot, you know, robots uh, of different types. Uh, building foundation models for general humanoid robots is one of the most exciting problems to solve in AI today. So that's a quote from a NVIDIA CEO. Uh, and so, yeah, that's what they discuss here. We now have the necessary technology to imagine generalized human robotics. So it's like they're inserting generalized artificial intelligence with human robotics. And the idea is to build a foundation model for general humanoid robotics. So that's, that, you know, and, and we've talked about like, you know, foundation models and some of these things. And of course, this is a moonshot because, you know, we need to be able to, we don't really have the pieces in place right now, but people want to kind of marshal a lot of resources to try to, to get at an answer solve the problem. This part is interesting. AGI, or artificial general intelligence, is a poorly defined term that usually refers to hypothetical human level AI or beyond that can learn any task a human could without specialized training. So this is where, you know, they, they recognize that uh, AGI and in fact intelligence is poorly defined. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
they, they, they had me at poorly defined. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you can have a moonshot when things are that poorly defined because you have to have a moon. You have to have a way to get there, you know. The the um, that path to AGI video was a discussion of um, neural MMO, which is a um, I believe is an open AI project. Okay. But yeah. The MMO standing for I can't remember. Massively. What does MMO stand for? Um, they are keeping the. They're keeping it secret. <laughs> I, I, I'm on their. I'm on the, looking at their doc. I added the, the a link to the documentation in the uh, oh, okay. reply to the video. Um, oh, yeah. And um, it's one of those acronyms where they're never telling. They're never going to tell you. Yeah, yeah. So this gets to Jesse's stuff, and you know. Yep. Uh, so this is uh, where he says, I am thinking of revving some, uh, reviewing, I guess, some D, uh, DB, uh, DBV and ABM related projects. So we've done this stuff with developmental bird vehicles, but, you know, we've also been doing things with uh, ABMs, um, agent based models. And so bringing those together, you know, it almost seems logical. But of course, that's, it hasn't been, we haven't worked on it in the same vein. So there are a lot of things we've been doing on either side that are kind of discordant. So uh, Avery men had mentioned a few things and I could do some related work there as well. I'm also excited with some potentially interesting applications on Google Summer Code. Uh, and then this is this paper that Jesse pulled up uh, on learning agent-based models from data. So this is uh, an interesting paper. Uh, we might get into it later. Uh, this is where, you know, they talk about agent-based models and sort of using data to train them. And so that, that, yeah, we'll talk about that maybe later. And then, yeah, so this is, uh, yeah. Oh, and then Jesse also posted this. Uh, this is a classic book, Growing Artificial Societies by Epstein and Axtell. That's what we were talking about. This is sort yeah. of a book, uh, sort of the one of the original books in the agent-based modeling field. So that's what people were. Yeah, yeah the, the the paper reminded me of um, um, Agent Zero, which maybe is like his third book. I, okay. I forget, but but where the, the agent-based model, I mean, uh, you know, each, each agent has a a you know potentially has like an interior model. Right, <clears throat> like a, um, you know, you could call it um, a vision model if you were kind of imagining like you know robotic simulations or something like that. But it could have cognitive model or some some um, decision model that um, for like you know macroeconomics or something like that. Yeah, um, I would I would also say the other link on that. About the book is for a course from uh, Santa Fe, very complex age for or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And um, I unintentionally found the videos for that course to look into YouTube for a bunch of ABM stuff. And um, I, when I don't know if we're gonna, I don't know if we're finished going through the Slack or not, but um, I'll say a few things about that when, when we're done. Okay. Yeah, well, we're done with this channel, so why don't we move on? We had a couple people joining us. We had Hamanchu, Jesse, and Paola. Hello, Paola. Uh, Paola introduced herself in the Slack a while back. So, um, yeah, so I guess, Jesse, if you want to say something, and then we can, I don't know if Paola wants to introduce herself to the meeting group, um, then we can do that. Yeah, I, I'll, I have a general like update that I'll say later, just for ABM stuff. Uh, it was a really interesting confluence of events this week because for a long time I've been um, trying to like Brayton Bridge vehicles was the first thing we all worked on, and and all of that. Like when I joined the lab a long time ago, and it's it's kind of been this thing, you know. 
on the back burner, what do we do with this? Uh, and also, it's an area of simulation or computer simulation that is, I, re I, want, I realize I want to look a bit more into because of theoretical impact. I mean, to be, to be very transparent, when I first joined, I didn't, I don't think I fully understood, I guess, the value um, or the reasoning behind why, why, why is, why the toy models, like why, why you, why simulating things a certain way um and now it's more of understanding that uh, it, a background to this has been a lot of my um uh, 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 some recent thinking and hearing discussions about basically synthetic data and and how do you get data for things that you can't empirically collect very easily or niche cases or special situations or a lot of things like that. So that's sort of a and that that came up at it that came up at a, an event I was at earlier this week, which I might talk about later, um, in a clinical AI sense, um, which sort of reinforced it from a different angle for me. But outside of that, um, you know, like there's a lot of what I would consider important like niche theories and models for the development or social interaction or agent social environment interaction that are in this space and and that you know are i realize it may actually be a, a faster it may be a more direct path to trying to address some of the work in the space that i realized previously. so that's sort of a one thing at play Second, well, I guess I don't know three or four, but one one research thrust is, is what people put on their web shows. Um, another one is I had a, a a really nice conversation with Avery, um, who has you know been dealing with a whole bunch of things and uh, health and other issues at play, and they. You know, sorted out some of this and that, and they're still, you know, doing this. They're still in the state that they've been in, but um, I had a really nice conversation that dovetailed into this about a certain things that they were exploring. Avery's always, 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 you know, there's sort of a <laughs> their natural byproduct of going about life is just generating degrees. <laughs> this is there's sort of this like, you know, uh, entity that goes through the world and just generates theories and it's a really fascinating thing and a great thing to be, you know, uh, a colleague and, and friends with someone like that in, in that way. Um, but uh, we had this conversation about certain things we'd like to explore that match with other projects and even even some things like plot features and other stuff too. So that that was another like big um, motivation for me, or at least not motivation, but like sort of a just a very closely connected dot. Uh, so you have sort of like this the Avery channel. You have this recent stuff on synthetic data and, and how to how do you actually push certain things forward, or at least get get some get theoretical movement in a certain space that's hard to get certain movement in. And you have our big history on ABMs and, and favorite vehicles. And I, you know, I wasn't I wasn't most involved in, in some of the coding for some of those things. And you know, there's there's different things up there now. So I, I it's kind of this kind of led to me looking at all this stuff again and then a couple of the papers and stuff I put in there too were like, okay, well that's that's cool. And suffice to say, um, I've actually spent a decent chunk, uh, more than a few, well, I guess more than a few hours now, uh, looking at Mesa. Um, and I really want, like, I want to finish setting it up. I'm, at, I'm, at, I'm like halfway through the tutorial course, um, unintentionally, but I guess I'm now part of the course. And I, I got into the course, which is basically just, it just has the supplemental materials and it's free. It, it's not like anything major, but it's just like a tutorial for how to actually set up like the sugar and spice trader model in Mesa um, through Complexity Explorer in the Santa Fe Institute. 
and um, I I don't yet know what to make of it entirely because I, I really want to do certain things and I don't know if I'm going to do it. But um, I will say that the videos are really nice uh, and, and good for people learning how to code in general because the way they're sort of there's sort of this cyclical introduction of like nice um, like clean coding and good um, like good practices. Uh, so I was like, oh, this is actually a lot better. This video is, is actually a lot better than many many introductory videos that I've that I've that I've seen that have nothing to do with ABMs. They're just like Im implicitly trying to instill some good habits. So I was actually impressed by that. Um, but yeah, that's that's that's. That's my um, impromptu uh, background, and it's I kind of I've kind of had this. It's the thing where it's like, okay, I really want to finish this thing and get 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 this tutorial set up fully, build the environment, um, and and try to work with it because I don't yet know. I know there's like you know part of Mesa it is that it's easy it's it's Python based, so you can do a lot of great things with, with all that's associated with Python. But um, it, ideally, you can have it set up so there's, I think, sort of a a real time manipulation ability with it. That's very complicated, and and I think it's like a web, uh, like a bit of a web display for it also. And a lot of things are baked into it. They're really trying to make it uh, go. And, and be robust and hopefully it will help us. Uh, that's, that's basically my my ABM update and I I hope I hope some good things come from it because I think it might be a place to at least put a variety of our ideas and, and do some things with it, but um, to be continued. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting area. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we haven't really I guess like explored the kinds of ways you can use them, especially with respect to synthetic data and you know generating that. So yeah, we might do that over the open source period too. Like we might uh, in the open source meetings, we might discuss that a little bit more um, and then get into maybe some more speculative stuff or maybe you even build some applic <clears throat> you know some demos of things that might become applications later. Because I you know I do want to bring some of the eight. ABM stuff back to uh, development of regular vehicles because, like I said, those things have kind of developed in parallel up to this point. So, um, so uh, it looks like Ajad wants to present. So I'm going to let him present. I don't know if Paula wants to introduce yourself to the group. Um, if you want to type it in the chat, you can. Okay. Hi, I'm very happy. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So first of all, I apologize because I've got this flu. I have been flu a lot in the last 24 hours. I don't have a terrible voice, but I just say hi. That I'm not sure what this what this is doing about. I still haven't worked out to do. But thank you for inviting me because obviously you are talking about very interesting things and I want to learn more. So I will watch the presentation and I will uh, and to sink in more meaningfully uh, next time. So thank you for giving me the word. So no problem. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we, we talk about a lot of different topics in the group. We have a lot of different topics in the lab, and this is kind of like uh, we discuss all the topics we go over in the lab. So it can be kind of a you know a smorgasbord of things uh, from week to week. But it usually just what's going on in our Slack is a good indicator of what we might talk about at the meeting. So we have a lot of, like today, you know, we're going to be talking about, uh, we talked about agent-based models. We're going to have some other things that we'll talk about. So uh, the, the presentation we're going to talk about now is going to be on uh, the uh, virtual reality and some simulations that you can build, you know, 3D simulations. And so Ajad Ishmael is here and he's going to present. Are you ready, Ajad? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, go ahead and uh, let me unshare my screen. Yeah, sure. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Hello, uh, so can you see my screen? Yes, yes. 
Goalkeeper, I'll start with the slideshow. Right. Yeah. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm Ajit Ismail, a chemistry student from ISO Mohali, India. Now, in this presentation today, I would like to describe my project, which is developing an interactive XR prototype for C. elegans connectom exploration. Okay, so these are my contents. So I'll start from the beginning. So let us all imagine exploring the complex neural network and organs of a living organism, not in a textbook page or a 2D image, but in a fully immersive environment. Now, this is what VR helps us to do. VR is basically a computer-generated simulation of a three-dimensional environment that can be interacted with using special devices. Now, the power of VR is revolutionizing education and scientific exploration. Now, students and various researchers can like immerse themselves in their scientific study through VR and manipulate all kinds of data in real time. Now, when we talk about our specific model, which is C. elegans, this ask why we are working on C. elegans specifically. Now, despite being a microscopic nematode worm, it holds a very vital role in biology. Now, why is this? Because it has many reasons, but the main reasons I will say are the first one is its transparent body, which helps in the mapping and studying of the various organs inside and uh, easy making it easier for fluorescent study, etc. Now also it has a defined number of cells, neurons. So we know where what is and what the function is. So it helps us to study the of mutation on the neurons on the organs easily, way easily compared to other model organisms. And also the most surprising thing is that such a microscopic worm actually has a lot of common grounds with humans and it shares a lot of biological pathways and genes. So we can actually use these C. elegans to study problems in humans and kind of relate to each other. So I would also like to share in a concise way uh, the most impactful discoveries. So it helped in neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, which helped to identify the genes and pathways involved. Aging, a lot of study has been made, uh, also a groundbreaking study in which actually the age was seen being reversed, but it is still in early development, but it is actually very innovative work. And in drug discovery, we can test potential drugs, how it affects the neurons, how it affects the organs of C. elegans, and then we can kind of relate to human genes and physiology also helps in understanding gene function. Now about our project, the details of our project basically is we have the primary objective, which is an interactive 3D model. So a user in this VR environment will be able to explore the connectomes from various angles and magnifications, can mark various neurons, can see the specific, the neuron pathway for like food, respiration, everything. Now the secondary objective would be to deploy it in a widely available XR platform so that it can be accessible to everyone easily and everyone should be able to use it for their own like educative needs or scientific needs, etc. Like we can employ it on device like MetaQuest. The third objective would be to make it open source. So science, like science is I promote science to be open source because it helps everyone involved. And I also am very interested in this project because it would end up being open source and it would benefit the whole scientific community and allow it to become better and help it in more like, be better. Now the main strategies that would be involved would be like integrate the various biological data sets from different sites like Bombay's Worm Atlas and process the data and it process data into a complex comprehensive understanding of the C. elegans within the XR model. Now we would leverage 3D models which will be made by Blender and Unity and make an immersive and interactive environment with the background of a typical VR model. 
A third one would be to foster collaboration and continuous improvement. Uh, since this is open source, we can ask for improvements and like we can get constant reviews from outer from the wider world and uh, improve our model respectively. So the main technologies I will be using for this project would be for 3D modeling, I would be using Blender since I have experience prior using Blender. For the game engine, for the movement all, I would be using Unity, which is an open source. Also, all the software involved will be open source since uh, that would be the best. For data integration and processing, I would use Paraview to get to process the data from the websites to convert it into a, a 3D model. For the XR platform education, I would use the rest software development kits, respective ones. Now for the initial in, uh, development, I plan to use a web XR since it is way easier for the like for the initial like bugging, debugging and all, but I'm still not confirmed. And also the agent-based modeling framework from Unity 3D will help in uh, completion of our project. Now, XR models in biology specifically is actually a very groundbreaking method because it is very hard for us to visualize these intricate organisms in details in our own mind. It is better to like immerse ourselves and study properly from the neuronal pathways itself. Now, XR models helps in this and it can help in various potential breakthroughs in biology which can accelerate humanity overall. Now, the project timeline which considers Google schedule for the program would be from first week five to 10. Uh, so week one to four would be the community bonding period. So during that time period, uh, I haven't mentioned in this since the main development would start from week five. So from week five, I would build the core XR environment, so nine to 10, integrating the features for connectome from the various data. Then 11 to 14, refine and enhance the additional data layers. And we 15 to 16, finalize and submit for evaluation. So the whole uh, timeline I have uh, defined in very, like defined very properly in my proposal, which I will share if someone wants to read it. So future prospects of my projects would be like, uh, it is very, the summer is actually a short period to like explore it very deeply, but I am sure I can make a very good model in the starting, but I would like to develop it further even after the summer. So the first kind of thing would be to like advance the functionalities, like make better haptic feedbacks and all. But if you are thinking about a future prospect, like way future, like first one would be like, I would like to study the movements of the C. elegans under different conditions. So like if there is a mutation in a specific neuron, how the movement would change, we can get the data from the scientific papers and this can be integrated into our model and help study for help scientific people to study more and understand C. elegans movement. Second would be gene expression integration by integrating the data from the gene expression and then we can show these genes are expressed by these parts of the C. elegans. Now this can be like visualized using color gradients of the C. elegans. So basically this helps like if someone is interested in C. elegans research, they would not have to like mark it by them. And like visualize the C. elegans from themselves and like mark it from there. It makes the research thinking and the scientific and learn. Now, the third main future prospect would be to create a kind of a virtual microscope since uh, it would help people like explore different magnifications and manipulate virtual controls like lightning. Like if you want to use a fluorescence microscope, uh, you can actually use this feature of the project. This is a far-fetched, no, not far-fetched. It would be in the later stage of development, but it is actually uh, idea for me to develop this so that is in short about the project like uh, in detail i've written everything in detail in my proposals like so if someone has any uh, queries or something i would like to help them uh, understand it also share them my proposal so this 
slide is about me. So I'm passionate about active matter and system biology. So, and also I've worked in several wet and dry labs in various colleges in India. I have also worked as a 3D modeler for an artificial firm, like mainly during designs for them, for their specific needs and understanding. Also, I have a personal experience working in the C elegance environment, as I've done in IIC Bangalore, in the, which is the most reputed university in India. So my project was basically on the effects of cell addition based neuro website on locomotion of C elegance with respect to food environments. So for this, I have done locomotion essays after the mutation. I've done the fluorescence tagging to understand like how which which all proteins are affected and how the movement are totally affected from this and also DNA sequence as an initial step before before the essays are done. So yeah, this is in short about my project. Mm, thank you for listening. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ajah. That's very good. Um, yeah, so I guess it's very ambitious. And I don't know if you are familiar with the um, Open Worm browser, but that's a good, actually a good starting point for what you want to do. Because the Open Worm browser is this blender model of the worm. It has all the, the cells. They're annotated. You know, it's in that 3D format, but then you can work from there. It's open source, so you can, you know, get it from a repository, open it up, and play around with it. You know, what you're looks like what you want to do is you want to annotate the connectome specifically. You want to do things with like gene expression, and that would yeah. certainly be a good thing to build into that because it's an, it's kind of a, you know, it, it's just basically the anatomy with labels on cells and you know there, there isn't much more detail than that um you know so there's a lot of stuff of course that c elegance has and you pointed out that you have you know there's an interest in say like drug development and disease studying yeah. disease and that so that would be a good starting point um to to work with and then to go from there and, and put some of these other things on it or you know build a especially I, i'm excited about like just getting that model into something you can explore in like a headset is like would be really good. But you know, there, there's so there's so much you can do. Uh, let me yeah. type in the um, this link here, and this is the link to the Open Room browser, and that's like the basic 3D model that exists now. But it's very much like just kind of a, a 3D model that doesn't have much more detail than the cells. So it's you know when we do modeling, it's usually like uh, to a certain level of specificity. And so, yeah. you know, a lot of times we'll build onto models and say, well, we're interested in these different things like, you know, molecular biology or, you know, other types of things where we can really play with, we're even just exploring the model in different ways. So that was really good though. It was, it was really good stuff. And I look forward to reading your proposal and, and um, you know, working on this. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So, yes, any questions for Ajad? Um, okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, let's see. I had a couple of things in the chat here. Um, Paola, you know, she had actually, uh, she asked, what does SMN stand for? And that's Saturday Morning Neurosimulation or Saturday Morning Neurosim. That's the name of the group. But we cover things more than like kind of we're doing neurosim now, but we're kind of you know we cover a little bit more than that. But it's just kind of a name that's kind of the name of the group. It's stuff. So uh, yeah. So since you're up for talks, here's a very short talk I am presenting virtually on Monday. You can watch it on your own time. So this is a link to the talk. Um, this is uh, it's screen uh, capture. Adama's here. Hello, Adama. Uh, Sarah is here, um, and Adama asks, should I present my project for next time? It, it depends. Are, do you want to present today, or are you ready to go, or do you want to present later? Uh, no, I'm not ready today, Okay. but uh, I would be ready for the next time, I think. Okay, well, that's fine, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome, yeah. So, yeah, thank you, Ajad, once again.
Uh, yeah, then my talk may be relevant here. Yes, that's great. Uh, so, Paola, I don't know if you're, uh, you can open up your talk. So, this is Paola's talk here. Um, uh, I don't want to play it, but model cards for NS. So, this is uh, like for machine learning. Yeah, this is good stuff. This looks like good stuff. This is, I guess, model cards. Um, did you want to say anything about the talk itself or? Uh, hi. 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 Can you hear me? Yes. Terrible, terrible voice and terrible connection. So I, it's a, just um, a lightning talk that I'm giving at uh, a conference on Monday in London. <clears throat> And it builds on some work which I started years ago uh, when machine learning became a little bit frightening. And as a <clears throat> knowledge person, I demanded uh, uh, natural language explanation for the machine model. And, uh, and then I suggested we should have a natural language presentation for all algorithms. And then I realized there were model cards which were being made by uh, some Google people already, uh, which I cited. I wrote a few papers and the citations are all there, so I don't remember their names now. But what I think is happening now is uh, we may need some uh, ML for model cards themselves rather than for just the neural uh, brain data sets. So we have a lot of ML for brain data, but can we have should we have or could we have some ml for model cards or i think so and so i started working in that direction very crudely because i'm actually not very hands-on i'm just regular thinking but when it comes to doing things i, I struggle I, I have to put a lot of effort so this talk is saying is there anyone interested in this work and someone does someone want to work with it because i think it's going to be very fast and maybe there is something already being done on those lines but this is the thinking is there. And then the other important thing is this work could help us, uh, I think, is working towards querying open data sets, open brain data sets, uh, um, over the open web. So at the moment, you can only query data sets in databases if you know the data structure, as far as I've been able to see it. Even then, you've got to be very good and very lucky to find the answers. So what I think we should aim for is we are looking now at this uh, um, large language models where people use the natural language interface to ask the question to the model and say, oh, blah, 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 blah. So I think model cards for neuroscience are going to help us to build large languages. I'm not a programmer, so I'm not. if, if I wish I could just do it myself all the time. I can barely scrape some HTML and all that's it. So this is the work. This is the talk. It's a very short talk, and probably this talk about the talk is longer than the talk itself. That's great. Yeah, that's that's definitely something we've talked about in the group. I know Jesse, in particular, is interested in in some of this, and in fact, it's probably how we got uh, connected because you know we've been doing this. We have this long term interest in like AI ethics. And in doing uh, AI type model, working with like AI models like LLMs and other types of machine learning. And, uh, so I, I don't know if Jesse had anything to say about it. Um, I didn't get to, I had to step away for some of it, but yes. Um, two, two things on that front for me. Uh, we, it's been in a little bit of hiatus because I didn't usually for this, we have a group. Uh, society ethics and technology, or like a, a working group, I guess is I'll call it. Um, and they've been a little bit of a hiatus. I haven't talked about them as much, as much, but um, that's definitely relevant to that. And um, on a somewhat more direct note, um, I'm actually taking a course on like I forget if it's called like fairness because I mean like data ethics, basically ethics in in a data science context, um, which I'm. Uh, just starting this week, and I'm really curious to talk to some of the professors about their research, kind of cutting across a bunch of domains, you know, like uh, cognitive science and ethics and causality and stuff like that. So um, that should be fun too. But yeah, I, I'll I, I'll uh, I'll go through the presentation 
and then you can follow uh, uh, Paolo's presentation, follow up on it there, or, or talk about it in, in the Slack channel for, for that. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's good. Yeah, thank you, Paolo. Um, and Sarah's here. Hello, Sarah. Um, yeah. Hello. Hi, I've not been keeping well much this week, so I haven't been able to do much. I kind of forgot the uh, timing of the meet as well, so I was a little late. Um, but apart from that, like I hope you all had a chance to maybe go through the proposal. I submitted that last week, a uh, little after the meet. And I was just trying to look around with some open source LLMs, like kind of trying to run them on my local system and such. So that's about it. Oh, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, so we like yeah, open source large language models, of course, are really interesting. You can run them on your machine, on your local machine with some difficulty, I'll say. But like, you know, that that's good that you can do, like you can train custom models and things like that. So that's something good to explore um, to see, you know, where you can get with that. Um, yeah, yeah some, there like some small uh, models are like, you know, even runnable on local, like my personal computer, for example, like 7 billion parameter models are, but like the larger ones do get a bit <clears throat> problematic, like they require some much more computational resources. Right. But yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what's possible and what's not. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we have, uh, let's see, we had some more things in the chat here. Um, this is uh, from Homanshu on OpenLLMs. So there's a whole reposit or a whole uh, readme here on the OpenLLM repositories that exist. Just someone's collected these. So they're actually, you know, a large, there's such a proliferation of these kind of models that you have to, you know, really kind of do your due diligence and seeing what's available. Uh, but there are all these different language models. And, of course, the language models have different attributes to them, different things underlying them. And then you have, um, you know, the number of parameters, the checkpoints, the release dates. So some of these are older. Some of these are newer. Um, and there's a, you know, open source license here. Uh, so this is something, you know, like, and, and of course, if you go to Hugging Face, there are a lot of options as well where you can, like, look at the different models. Uh, you know, some of them are quite minimal. Some of them are, you know, advanced. And, you know, if you're thinking about integrating that with something like an agent-based model, you know, I'd think about, like, getting something that is, you know, you don't want to get too much model for what you want to do because it does. there is a lot of computational overhead there. So it's, you know, um, there's a lot to sort out there, <laughs> but that's, that's part of why we do like research, right? We try to find the best answer. So yes, thank you, Hamanchu, for that resource. Just also wanted to make a plug for Brain GPT as, um, as a cool project that's, you know, using large language model, foundation model, and then um, fine-tuning it on on neuroscience data um, and trying to make it a um, uh, you know an augmentation tool for 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 neuro right, yeah. cool project yeah so yeah there's a lot of stuff and that's like that's specifically for neuroscience data you said uh, it, it's you know for for like understanding papers and being able to All right. like like hypothesize about um, yeah about work I, I I think I dropped a, I'll check but but Brad Love gave a talk at the Phil like two weeks or so ago um, that was a nice overview of it you know like what he's trying to do with it and you know where where it's at right now so. Yeah. I'll, I'll check that it's there. All right, yeah. Yeah, it's, this is definitely... And, and, and it's also a community effort. Right, yeah. right. So, yeah, this is about, like, finding things in the literature. And, you know, this is always, like, a big thing that, you know, you're trying to wade through the literature, but also 
I think we've we've talked about this in some of uh, in cognition futures is that you can customize these for different research domains. So like this is customized for neuroscience and training it specifically on like neuroscience literature. So you know uh, uh, an LLM might be trained on a very general data set, and you know you're not going to find good answers for neuroscience there. But if you train it on like certain sets of literature, you can actually ask really focus questions, you know, prompt it very specifically and get good answers. And it looks like they're even trying to go towards some sort of meta-analysis aspect too, which is interesting because that's kind of a hard thing to do. <laughs> and, you know, if we could do a meta-analysis for everything, we could, but we can't because, you know, it's just not something that's rewarded, but also it's very hard to do uh, well. So, yeah, brain GPT. <laughs> We had a little comment in the uh, Slack about different types of GPT that have been coming out. So, <laughs> yes, yes, it, it, it was also when I passed, a, a, or I was behind a car in San Francisco that had a, a license plate car GPT. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure there will be a car GPT at some point too. That's the thing. Uh, yeah, so this is actually uh, the paper, the archive paper Hamanchu posted. So this is, uh, you know, this is Brad Love, who's a neuroscientist and some other people here. And uh, this just kind of describes the uh, model that they're using and everything. Okay, so that's great. Um, so, yeah, why don't I go to this paper that I kind of promised I'd return to. So Jesse was talking about some of the stuff he wanted to do with agent-based models. And uh, I know that Hamanchu, you know, you worked on some agent-based modeling stuff uh, two summers ago, and Sarah's interested in agent-based models, which is good. Um, but this is, you know, something I think, you know, I'd like to integrate with some of the stuff we've done with Bradenburg vehicles, and even like some of the stuff with biological modeling that we do would be interesting to, to kind of explore from this angle. But, um, you know, there's this aspect of training your models with data and, you know, in biological models, oftentimes we have different ways we can model things. We can do, like, you know, we'll often need a lot of data from experiments, data from, like, you know, uh, cell uh, segmentation, things like that. And we can build models. And the models we build are only as good as the data we get. So if we don't get very good data, we have to sort of, we don't have a very good model. Sometimes we can use things like, uh, you know, Pseudo data, which means we kind of simulate the data, what it should look like. So if we have like maybe some behavioral thing we were interested in, we can use a data, we can just make up a data set and say, this is distributed according to a certain distribution, and we can draw from that distribution, and it gives us, you know, something to work from. And we can actually, you know, um, do it that way, or we can build a model. We know kind of how, say, for example, lineage tree works. In developmental biology so we can build a, a, a synthetic lineage tree sample that tests some hypotheses and, and so forth so there are a lot of ways we can do things in biological modeling of course we can also do things like you know we can uh supposing you know different cell fates see you know if if we assign different labels to things what happens um you know in the simulation so there are a lot of ways we can do this uh, for a lot of different areas. Um, but this paper here is on learning agent-based models from data. And so agent-based models have typically been set up where you have a grid of cells and you assign the cells like, you know, some identity. And then you critically, you know, the cells have uh, neighbor-based neighbor rules. So in other words, um, cells will exist in a grid and then those cells will be related through some set of rules. So I'm going to draw the cell on a board here. Uh, this makes it easier to understand a little bit. So your typical agent-based model, you know, looks something like a grid. Uh, it's usually square. It can be uh, toroidal as well, which means it just goes around. You know, it it it's continuous. But like for now, we'll just draw a grid here. And this grid has cells, so each of these cells have some sort of, each cell is basically an agent. 
or it can be occupied by an agent. Sometimes you have things like turtles or something that occupy this group. But the point is, is that each one of these cells is has an identity. And so it could be like a, uh, a turtle of a certain color or a, a chess piece of a certain type or something of a certain shape. And so it has an identity. And then you know, have all these neighboring cells. So this cell exists in a neighborhood, and it's, you know, how many cells do we have here? Five cells. And if we do a toroidal representation, this cell is also a neighbor, but, or these cells here too. So, um, but you have this neighborhood of cells. The idea is that this cell and this agent in this cell will interact with these other cells, and they might have agents or they might not. And there's some set of rules here that are used to communicate. So, in other words, the rules, uh, you know, if there are two cells that are adjacent, there's an interaction rule. So the interaction rule basically says if your neighbor is of a certain state, you, you know, that factors into uh, changing your state over time. So this grid is not just static. It has like a time component. It's usually discrete time. So, you know, we have different times, one, two, three, and on. And so for every time step, an agent in this cell will check its neighbors to see what its state should be in the next time point. So for T1, this might be a red agent, and there might be you know agents in these other cells. And the rule might be if all your agents, if all of the spaces around you are occupied, turn blue. Now in this case, not all the spaces are occupied, so the agent remains red. Uh, in some case, if there was another agent here, then that agent might turn blue. And it's just, you know, some rule that we made up. And so these rules are important, but they have to be based in reality. So if we're modeling something like a social system or a biological system using this kind of model, first of all, we have to, you know, it has to be some sort of collective behavior. So we can't model something that isn't a collective behavior on a model like this. But also, you know, we have to make sure that we know what the interaction rules are and that they make sense. And so, you know, sometimes that means that the agents are trained with data so that, you know, their states maybe are more well informed. Sometimes the interaction rules come from data as well. So that's that's kind of the the you know, the very fast version of talking about agent-based models and what they do. So this paper talks about learning agent-based models from data. Um, and so let's let's go into the abstract, um, and then I'll put the uh, paper in the Slack if you want to read more. Agent-based models, or ABMs, are used in several fields to study the evolution of complex systems from micro-level assumptions. So these grids here that you see are, you know, collective structures. You have microstates, which are the states of the agents. And then you have macro states, which are the states of the grid and the agents within the grid. And so you might have patterns within this grid that become these macro states. Uh, so that's that's what what they what they mean by that. And it's really you know if you know anything about emergence or heard the term emergence, that's what this refers to. Uh, is this you know going from sp single agents to this these larger scale structures, and that those agents interact and produce something that is you know, sort of a collective behavior. Um, so, however, a significant drawback from agent-based models is their inability to estimate agent-specific or micro-variables, which hinders their ability to make accurate predictions using micro-level data. So that means if you're, you know, you're training it on data for individual agents, it's hard to sort of estimate those variables. Um, and it's something that you, you know, you can do by hand, you can do by maybe creating an estimator, but it's very hard to do, especially at different time points. So, you know, having this information at different time points and having that be accurate is a problem. You may be able to get like information about the initial state, but it's hard because if you look at an emergent system like a city, you know, you'll often look at individual data, but it's not like, you know, at different time points that data might be aggregated, it might be averaged. And so giving each agent sort of the average state doesn't give you a very good agent-based model. It doesn't really uh, run well in the way that I just described. So we need to have be able to train the individual agents, 
have information that, you know, kind of allows us to plug in that missing information and improve the performance of micro level representation, which then gives us a better description of the collective behaviors. So we begin by translating an agent based model into a probabilistic model characterized by a computationally tractable likelihood. So they're using likelihoods that, um, you know, are realistic to the real world. Next, we use a gradient-based expectation maximization algorithm, which is well, just a way to sort of, um, you know, we have this, this min-max sort of approach here to maximize the likelihood of the weight and variables. So there are a lot of variables that we can look at uh, that influence sort of the microstate. Uh, we showcase the efficiency of our protocol in an ABM on the housing market, where agents with different incomes bid higher prices to live in high income neighborhoods. So there's a lot of agents that are in this housing market. who are all sort of competing, comparing what their neighbor is doing. And there's this rule that says, you know, maximize or minimize accordingly. Our protocol produces accurate estimates of the latent variables while preserving the general behavior of the ABM. Moreover, our estimates substantially improve the out of sample forecasting capabilities of the ABM compared to simple heuristics. So this out of sample is, you know, a term that they use, the term of art in machine learning that basically refers to the inability, you know, inability of our data sets even to sort of describe low frequency events or things that aren't really within the distribution that you're using to model your, you know, to plugging into your model. So for example, if I had a data set that I uh, took that I wanted to train my agent on. And it was sort of a, a Gaussian model or a normal distribution of uh, different types of behaviors. Now, there are behaviors that exist on the tails of that distribution, and there are you know, behaviors that maybe don't even exist in that distribution. Because you remember, our distribution is just a sample of the real world. And if I have a training set that sort of has you know, a variety of different um, you know, behaviors, that data is incomplete in the sense that it doesn't observe all behaviors over all time. So, you know, if I like look at this group right now, you know, there's certain behaviors that we're exhibiting in the meeting. There's certain behaviors that you might exhibit in the Slack that are different. And if I just use this meeting as a training model to train a model of each of you, it would be incomplete because I wouldn't have all the range of behaviors. Sometimes there are rare behaviors that I wouldn't pick up, you know, maybe from our sampling strategy that also fall into this, you know, out of distribution type or represent this out of distribution type, um, you know, uh, problem or, or sample. So we have this out of sample forecasting ability. So the ability for the model to sort of forecast these out of sample things. And this is important because, you know, a mean, it, when we take the mean of something, we kind of smooth over a lot of behaviors that might be sort of rare or might be uh, not the mean behavior, but are nevertheless important for some of this um, emergent behavior to, to occur. So this is, you know, one of the many problems with, you know, individual agents doing things that contribute to collective behavior. And in machine learning, out of sample, uh, distributions are a really interesting topic because oftentimes in machine learning we're taking exemplars and we're kind of finding the average behavior of those exemplars and that's something we try to use to generalize and oftentimes we fail at that because generalization on the one hand is you know where we find sort of the average or mean behaviors but on the other hand that mean only describes maybe a portion of the distribution and so we always have these behaviors that fall outside of the mean, and it's hard to kind of predict those and incorporate those into the model. So, you know, it, maybe there are approaches to solve that problem, but people haven't really hit upon it yet. Our protocol encourages modelers to articulate assumptions, consider the inferential process, and spot potential identification problems, thus making it a useful alternative to black box data simulation methods. So, you know, we can use, like, for example, in our model here, 
we can use a black box to model each one of these agents. So a black box is where we just have like this box where we have an input and an output. And it's not based on any observation. It might just be simply a list of rules that we expect. Or it could just be that there's a random aspect to it where it just generates a random behavior or generate some deterministic behavior based on the rules. So if these conditions are met, put this give this output. And of course you can see the rigidity of that, where it doesn't give you any unexpected behaviors. Now, you know, all this is to say that we can improve upon this black box model. So the black box model is, you know, very good for kind of estimating, it's sort of as a heuristic for saying, this is basically how a generic process works. So a lot of agent-based models are based on like, you know, they'll have a model of like, um, you know, a uh, general economic model. And of course, you think about economics, you know, they, they're trying to build a general theory, but of course that's very hard. And what we're doing in agent-based modeling is almost going in the reverse direction, starting with a very generic model and trying to work out the details of it. But anyways, uh, so, you know, training your agents with data especially synthetic data means that you're improving upon this black box by providing, you know, different instances, providing some sort of distribution of real world things, and then maybe hitting upon some of these uh, outer distribution cases. And that's an old D for short. So that improves our black box. Another thing I'd say about like synthetic data is you know, the synthetic data that we build, if we wanted to build synthetic data instead of training it with real world data, is that we have to consider the out of distribution aspect of this. So we don't want to just create a synthetic data set by saying, we're going to create a Gaussian distribution of this behavior. So it means that, you know, we have this distribution of behaviors that's distributed normally. We have a mean. Variation. We have a variance, and we have a mean, which is this line here. We have a variance which goes, you know, across the tail here. And these tail cases then are very poorly represented in the data set. So, you know, this is something you're going to draw from, but not very frequently. So we still run into this problem of sort of the black box where we don't get a sense of the sort of, you know, the sort of uh, mode of, of behaviors that can be exhibited here. So we really want to kind of work from maybe a normal distribution or Gaussian distribution and work outward and try to refine some of these cases out on the tails. And you may have heard of things like long tail behaviors, which means that in some models, most of the behavior, interesting behaviors are actually on the tails and not in the meat of the distribution. So you might have a distribution like this, where you have long tail behaviors that are out here, very rarely observed, but very important. Actually, that's the meat, sort of the mode of the uh, behavior is here. So our black box might be based on these behaviors, and but these behaviors then may be more rare, but are still also important. So we want to be able to sample our distribution evenly. So when we create a, a synthetic model, we want to take all these different features of it into effect or into account and build, you know, a model that represents what's going on in the real world in different types of systems. So, yeah, they talk about agent based models as being models of autonomous agents and interact with one another. You need to create interaction rules, but you also need to create training data for the individual agents so that they can interact properly. And so, this is an example here of their model. This is an agent-based model with agents in the cells. They also overlay this with data on, you know, median housing price and region of London that they're in. So the region is important for this model. And then we have, you know, a distribution of median prices. We have, uh, you know, people or agents that engage based on, you know, their ability to spend the median price versus the year. And then the standard approach is to take a model and match it to the data. In this case, what they're doing is forecasting, they're estimating latent variables and fitting the data that way. So there's they're doing this different kind of approach where 
they're actually doing latent variable estimation instead of just trying to match the model to the data. And so that's another thing to, to take into account is there are different statistical strategies to implement these kind of models. Yeah, so this is great. Um, thank you for that paper, Jesse. And we had some, uh, so yeah, Paola said, uh, okay, actually up here. Uh, so Morgan shared a video on, I guess, Brain GPT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 but I, I, I just, I, I noticed her, I wanted to ask uh, Paula, um, the talk that she's giving is for um, the Harmon workshop combined. Anyway, I, 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 okay, awesome. That, that, that's super cool. I mean, I, I, I love combined. Uh, um, I wasn't familiar with this, but, uh, but I'm just looking at it now. So I put a, I put a link in Slack. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Morgan. <clears throat> I'm sorry for the terrible talk. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, it was kind of fortunate because I am corresponding with Pat Ray because he's doing the open brain. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, have you seen his work on the open brain? I, 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 and the reason why I think it's, it's fundamental is because it runs from the browser. And of course, I haven't learned how to use it properly at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't spent much time. I don't have much time, I don't have much bandwidth, but I spent a few hours uh, and it's an excellent tool. Yeah. And then by chance, I realized he was doing a conference and I thought I need to share what I'm doing, which also is completely non unfinished work, but I think there was good thinking behind it. So thanks a lot, Morgan, for the yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I, I didn't realize the, the other connection there too, because yeah. So the guy that um, that really runs uh, uh, Nura Fedora now, uh, Ankur Sinha, actually works on Open Brain. Um, so that's uh, I'm I'm checking it out now. I, I might ask if we, yeah, what uh, what's going to be happening there? Yeah, it's great. Uh, and then Paula said, this is so leading edge stuff. Thanks. Just see it in the thumbs up. And I suggest we paste the interesting links in the Slack. Otherwise, the pointers. Yeah, that's what we usually do. Um, and, you know, we have, uh, you know, so if you find something interesting, there are different channels you can put things in. Um, and so feel free to post something if you find it interesting. Uh, yeah. And then thank you. Yes. That's good. So are there any other comments or questions before we move on? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I regarding the paper we just discussed, mm. I um, I guess I guess it's something that I'd really like to basically revisit next week or, or so because I I feel like I've I have so much like I want to just get I want to get Mesa set up and and play with it properly and then i want to revisit things like this more because i i i didn't get to read this paper fully yet um but like i i kind of see some of like their other modeling stuff and i i like you know i i i i think you know we kind of touched upon i, I really like bradley's discussion about um you know other distribution uh, and uh, how how do we how do we do that and 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 you know i think there's some really it, it's 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 really interesting for me because um i am in two different sort of arenas where this is starting to um like hit me in the face, I guess, is like to be inarticulate about it. But one of them is it was sort of, you know, we're doing I'm I I'm this sort of project with uh DSM uh, stuff and, and 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 all this work on you know like the Morgan's computational psychiatry things and where do we go with that at sort of a human modeling level and 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 how do we have you know how do we <coughs> this sort of this sort of macro tension between, okay, uh, 
and getting in, how do you get empirical data and what are the limitations of getting empirical data about, about things, you know, both like modernizing that from, okay, here's better ways how to collect it versus here's ways it's really hard or impossible to collect the data. Um, uh, I saw Kyle's question about Mesa. It's, 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 um, if you go into the Brainberg vehicle chat, you can see a, a course there, but basically Mesa is a Python, Python three based, I don't know, framework or I don't know to call it exactly application. Maybe it's, it's a, it's, it's an agent based modeling. Um, I don't know what to call it actually. Project. Projects, yeah, let's say an agent based modeling project built on Python that's supposed to like be a little more modernized than you know, maybe like net local stuff and everything else. But you know, net local has its own things about too. But, but as I was saying, like we're kind of in this, there's this dilemma between getting good empirical evidence. And um, I, I think I just put something else in, um, I can't remember what. Slack, it might be. Um, uh, let's, let's, let's just try to speak quickly because I know we have other things to cover. Um, it's just the tension between getting, like, what what can we get with data? How can we improve the data and opportunities for? Oh yeah, um, there was the the the, the developmental like. International I like ICDL, I think or something like developmental learning conference that's in Austin that I can't go to. I'd love I'd love to go to it and I love to submit to that next year. Maybe with some things you're talking about here in terms of developmental baby vehicles or other things like that. But like a big thing from when, when we were at um, the Cogsci discussion group a few years ago was, you know, <clears throat> how do you, you know, it's difficult to to model certain things in developmental spaces uh you know we had a whole like Ariente uh or Ariente, i forget her name but but basically that the paper we reviewed there talked like you know it's hard to certain things are just not very amenable to getting data in a conventional classical scientific empirical way right so i think we're all kind of familiar with that but i'm just saying that here to say that's part of one of the like influences at play. But um, I, I, I'm I getting the sort of the personal modeling of it, but also I think there's sort of a, there's a whole range of things I'm seeing in terms of like potentially, I don't know if I want to say data ethics, but sort of in a, like modeling things that are not yet, um, like that you just not that that may exist in an empirical sense, but aren't going to be able to to be modeled very easily. And like I think some of the things that Bradley said in his, in his talk or was like, yeah, if you get this, this big chunk of accurate data, you know, ABM is sort of this time step dependent, you know, approach. And then a lot of the data you get may not fit that very well. But how do you how do you try to do emergent things in this sense? And what what can actually be collectively modeled or not? So it's sort of like. I, I guess I'm I'm just in this space of trying to figure out, yes, specifically with Mesa, what can I do? But also I, I have this sort of itch to see what can what can either agent-based modeling do or returning towards some of our um I don't want to say roots, but past efforts in the brain brain vehicle sense, in in sort of the metabrain senses to either do synthetic data kind of stuff or, or just uh, it, I guess I just have a, a, a different perspective now on some of those things, and I really want to get like get to a place where I'm a little more familiar with working some of the code that would that make some of the models, you know, uh, some kind of a useful simulations that we could do with it, um, and and go there. But that's that's mostly where I'm at with it right now, and I. I really like to revisit the paper more and some other topics we just had, and I think we'll have a little cold. Like, I know there's some interest in the summer, uh, like people wanted to do like either agent based modeling or reinforcement learning or LLM. And like, we have this like uh, the summer cohort of, of opportunity there. So hopefully, I don't know. I don't know if I'll be able to get anything, a lot of momentum and time to really boost into that, but I, I, I think that could be an interesting topic. 
the next few months that we look into. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's great. Um, oh yeah, Morgan. Well, yeah, I, I was I, just uh, about the synthetic data because just asked and and um, uh, y you know there there's 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 easy ways to generate synthetic data if you know what your I mean the example that I gave was um, you know we can generate a lot of MRI data that's useful for testing segmentation tools whether yeah um, and like that could still be useful those segmentation tools could be useful on rare MRI examples, right? Um, um, but that doesn't, you know, that, that, that doesn't kind of cover all the kind of rarities that you might find in say, rare neurological cases and, and the kind of synthetic data that you might be interested in. Like, like if, if, if that makes sense, um, uh, but I'm really interested in the problem, and and you know, um, the 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 talk from um, um, Danilo Buzdick, Buzduck. Um, sorry, I don't really know how to pronounce his name right. But uh, um, it, 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 uh, it was at Brain Space Initiative just last week. Was really focused on this kind of diversity first um, modeling. Of, of of psychiatric neuroimaging, and uh, it, it, really interesting. Like, doesn't necessarily get to this this synthetic data problem, but but it was really you know uh, e emphasizing and trying to think about new ways to capture the 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 real heterogeneity that we have in in the psychiatric. Kind of, examples and and i think is like even well certainly we we we're better at capturing the physiology to some degree in neurological examples anyway um the the other thing i, I wanted to mention was the um the agent-based modeling uh or you know one of my interests and since since pal is here and uh, uh this made me think about combine um is the relationship of, of these models and especially their kind of newer newer directions and the glazier you know cellular pots models right it, 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 you know so like the kind of modeling that we want to do for tissue modeling and and you know multicellular modeling um, in general and uh, yeah I, I'd love to to um, oh yeah cool um, it, anyway, it, it would be great to, um, um, yeah, keep keep open that direction as well in, in terms of how it relates to the tissue engineering and modeling. Yeah, and, and of course, going back to what Ajad was presenting on, you know, we've tried to apply this sort of cellular POTS model to C. elegans as well. And, and you know, there there is the 3D model, which is great, and you can explore it. But, you know, there are also these other kinds of models you can use or incorporate. And they're sort of agent-based, but cellular POTS is very similar to an agent-based model where you have a bunch of units or cells that sort of interact. But you're trying to model a tissue instead of like, you know, uh, uh, like a, a society or, a, you know, a bunch of collective agents. I guess it's the same thing in a lot of ways. But it's it's a different way. It's a physics based model, so it has a lot of properties yeah. that are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was nice the the the, the spatial omics um, seminar this oh. week was was this woman at uh, Columbia doing, yeah, you know, multiple um, uh, protein test uh, spatial omics. <laughs> uh, uh, but she she. Uh, she was really interested in in talking to people who were thinking about um, you know she, she it seemed to me that she was like 
trying to um, reference Levin, but not necessarily knowing Levin, <laughs> like collective collective cellular intelligence, right? And and you know the kind of stuff that again comes up all the time. You know, um, Glazier's Glazier's uh, uh, online courses and his uh, um, his weekly meeting has a funny name. You might think like, oh, this wouldn't be of interest because he calls it like the like weekly pandemic. Oh yeah, like <laughs> like, uh, like he's got all this COVID stuff in, in the name. Yeah. But, but he's really just talking about computational epidemiology, right? Right, right. And, 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 and it, well, it's like, it's like computational epidemiology with, like, a, like a full human digital twin, <laughs> right? Oh, so, it, so it could have the, uh, 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 it can have, you know, viral components it can have you know cell cell interaction component you know it can have like any bit of physiology in it right but anyway you, you think you're joining like a pandemic call <laughs> it's so weird but but you know like this week he was you know he had a um, a woman talking about um like reduced ordered models you know it was like 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 a super kind of like pde related you know, uh, uh, discussion, um, you know, s s super relevant. Like, like it, she was, she was really talking about like how to reduce the, the model order in a directed way to then better capture the, the few things that you were actually measuring in this complex system, yeah. you know, like, like a really interesting approach or, you know, connection to that. But, um, anyway, sorry. I, I think there's so many really interesting directions and, and Glazier's work, you know, and the um, uh, Pala, the, the people that combine that I've followed before is the, the Morpheus group in um, Dresden, just as, as examples of some of this, uh, this kind of computational modeling that I think is, is really related to, um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. There is a lot of complexity. <laughs> yeah. So, Margaret, let me just say something very quickly. I have been around a lot, and I have seen people and a lot of money, uh, project money, and effort and energy getting lost because, not because the question is not interesting. We get sidetracked because we are, we are fascinated by the new technology and new capability, and because computationally there is a challenge and people get lost in that certain performance measurements and, and mm. in the mathematics and, and all of that. And I said, wait a minute, we have all this technology and we still cannot answer the question completely. So I mentioned in my talk. So I think with given all the capabilities we have, we should be able to make it we, we as as a humanity and as a, uh, people who have some understanding of what, how technology is developing, we should be able to to help um, solve the problem. And, and we don't do that because very often the funders and the universities are not really interested in solving the problem. You see, that's, that's a, a problem set. Very often the, 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 the project itself is designed so that it leads to another project. And that's unfortunate, that's the way it is. And, uh, and some people are outside that system like myself and said, you know, just give me the answer. How do I solve the problem? And I think it's nice to try to keep that in mind because you guys are awesome and, and you've got hands on and you know everything already. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. The, the, yeah, there is, there is, um, it is easy to get lost in the complexity. Though. Yeah. You know, and yeah. Uh, so. so, yeah, we had a couple of comments in the chat again. Yeah, Jesse, you can talk about the AI cure stuff in a minute. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, nice to meet you, Morgan. It's from Paula. Oh, and uh, yeah, it's important to keep in mind that we are trying to answer urgent questions. Absolutely. Get to the gist and do not get lost in the complexity. Yeah, so it's like a lot of times in modeling, we pick and choose what we model out of all the stuff that we can measure and, and not measure, but like characterize. We pick, you know, certain things and that's usually our level of abstraction. So we might say, I'm interested in the behaviors of cells or interactions with their neighbors. I don't care about what 
you know, maybe I care very at a very, you know, coarse grain scale what the behavior of the cells are. So it might be expressing some gene or it might be like moving in some direction or it might be sending out a projection to my neighbor. And that's all I care about. I don't care about the process behind that. I don't care. And so people make those decisions when they try to solve a problem. And the, of course, the problem is, is that that's, you know, we don't, that may or may not be like the most important thing in that interaction. And so, you know, it's just, sometimes it's, you know, very much a, a, a choice that's like, this is the easiest thing to measure or to model because it's a very simple process. And so in that sense, it's very easy to model that interaction. But on the other hand, there are other things going on that we don't really capture in the model. And so, you know, I think a lot of times people view models and they think they're magic and they don't get down to that sort of aspect of it as, as to what we, you know, what choices do we make in what we're modeling? And, you know, what do we, what's the consequence of that when we say, okay, let's generalize the results of this. So it's very important to kind of think at that level when you're doing this kind of thing. Yeah. And so, yes. So Jesse, why don't you tell us about AI cures and some of the things there? Yeah. Um, I, I, I really just do a high level commentary on it. Um, because I think I want to, I'm, I want to write a small piece on, on everything. Like there's been a lot of things that that's, um, it's a very interesting week for me, I'll put it that way, because it's and it's kind of the start of the next quarter for my uh, you know, my uh, graduate program. And <clears throat> excuse me, I attended uh, in person, which is also kind of interesting. There's in person uh, two events here in Boston, Boston area this week. And I've had a lot of reflection that I mentioned already, like the Avery conversation too, which is sort of another angle to these things. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think I, I do want to like make a note, like if I go back and every video, like a lot of really good commentary on modeling happened uh, now and during the, the age of base modeling paper and other things too. So I think, I think that should be um, revisited. But uh, I'll try to share my screen about the A, the, this, there's not really a lot of, I, I have actually a ton of um, like screenshots, but they won't, they won't really be available. So I'm just, I'll just, all I really do is share um, like this tab, which is going to be kind of boring, but um, this is the first event. Um, on April 1st that I went to, which feels like a month ago um, on Saturday, but that's Monday. And it's, you know, these events are kind of, it's a little bit of a, hey, we're a really cool group, come look at what we're doing. You know, like this, that's, it's, it's kind of falls under the class of that. But um, I think, what do we, what do we really take away from it? is um and they, they cover these areas of of like clinical ai regulatory patient data and some some ethics and fairness things too um i guess i would say these the keynotes here were very interesting in terms of just conveying sort of what like what's happening even at the level of you know mass general brigham for those who aren't around here, is like Mass General, like a major hospital um, in Boston and in the world. And Mass General Brigham is this sort of, you know, kind of partnership at a level of like providing care from from Brigham and uh, and uh, Mass General and this sort of this sort of the sort of these upper level health. Uh, you know, where, 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 is, where is health and healthcare going at, at the level of clinical AI? I mean, you know, MIT is a uh, tech school that they partnered for this event. I think it's the third or fourth year they've done it. And <clears throat> I, I guess I'll really quickly just say some of the quotes that have really stood out to me 
Um, oh, geez, I wonder if I can find them again. Um, well, one of them was basically just, I thought, I thought it was quite interesting that I think during the very first keynote talk, um, Isaac or Zach Pahane, um, he made this, this point that was um, almost like buried because it wasn't like a headline point. But he said this, he said this remark kind of almost casual, not under his breath, but like it was, I think it was actually sort of, I would almost say it's sort of the point of the talk, even if it wasn't really what he was taking away thing for it was. But it was basically something along the lines of, it's a matter of priorities and not just theory. And I think um, it's, what, what does it mean in the context that was presented and what does it mean to me? It all slightly different perhaps, but in the context it's presented and it's sort of like, we have so much, we have an increasing amount of data and we have an increasing amount of what we can do with the data, even in the healthcare clinical space. But his remark was sort of about like we have to really make like there's a there's a very serious challenge of making choices about what to do um, with within these spaces um, and 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 both for you know there there were some tongue in cheek comfort tongue tongue in cheek um, comments later on like oh like why like why is there so much what's the incentive what's the incentive, you know, for, for really investing in AI right now? And, and there are some kind of snickering open comments about like, oh, well, of course it's to save a patient's lives um, and improve patient care. And then I was like, well, or, or is it just ROI and like the incentive to, to do the money part of it too? So it was, it was an interesting, it was an interesting mix of like a very, you know, um, a, like a very, intentional effort on pushing things forward in the sense of okay let's have these discussions let's be frank about them but also it kind of dovetailed i didn't get to watch all the ones at the end but it kind of dovetailed into the, the sort of responsible ai component of like what are we doing with these priorities and how do we represent our stakeholders and all that um but just to, to kind of a, a few more points to mention about this um uh, let me close this here. The there's you know LLMs are kind of the big the big thing right now. How how can LLMs interface with data? There's a bunch of posters on you know creating more accessible, more I don't know enhanced. I don't want to say enhanced communication with either patient records or, or the management of certain things. And also there's a lot of work on a lot of spaces around this topic on like transcribing conversations with doctors. And I actually mentioned that um, last year, like the 2023 triple AI, there was someone there doing a specific like, note taking with doctors uh, and, and like trying to trying to find out what, uh, what things were, um, basically missed in conversations and how, yes, unfortunately, there was data showing, you know, um, if, if you were like a woman or a minority, you were more likely to not be listened to fully um, and, and things like that, which is not a surprise, unfortunately, for many people. But um, just, it's sort of this interesting, there's the clinical AI, which had a lot of things and a lot of, um, oh, one, one of the topics that was actually more technical was um, like using generative AI as modeling um, like predicted developments for how can I how can I say it? They wanted to they're using 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 AI to help visualize such a development of it was more 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 specific than just like certain diseases, I guess. But um the, the the different applications for how to use generative AI, which is sort of, it's it's really tough for me because I don't know how to feel about some of it in terms of what could actually come from it in a good way versus what's sort of, I don't I don't know the space well enough to know is like what is sort of the 
you know, LLM washing, like, oh, we got to talk about LLM, we got to talk about generative AI. I don't quite know it very well, but it's a really nice, like, exposure to that in the front line sense of here's, here's the, like, you know, the med students, and here's the tech students, and here's what's going on, how to use it in their the specific settings to model certain new developments, which is okay, cool. Um, the I, I, I want to write up a little more formal piece on that, on that later, and I'll also mention, I'll really briefly mention this other event too that I attended, um, which doesn't have a great website, but um, uh, actually I can share, I just happened to see, um, I think I can do this. So I'm, uh, I'm, I guess it's fair to say friends uh, with uh, Dan Elton, who is someone, he and I, uh, we were kind of both from the same hometown almost, so like uh, a kind of hometown uh, back in New York, but we both happened to move to Boston. But there was this event that he, um, Hosted and I, I attended and helped a little bit out with uh, Dan. Dan's did about AI events and stuff like that, and hosted this event from um, like the Mind First Foundation and Daniel Fajal. These are all this is all more like future forecasting and stuff like that, which isn't really what we talk about here that much. But it was very one of my takeaways from it was more, um, you know, if, if, if you're interested in, in sort of like that kind of discussion, you you, you can kind of see. Um, uh, Preston and Brian are from the, uh, I don't think they're, uh, yeah, they're from this, this group called the Mind First Foundation, which is sort of a, you know, future of humanity, and, and, and these are their presentations here, but they're sort of, how do we, you know, maybe merge with AI stuff and, and things like that, which is, you know, cool. And then Daniel Fagel is a bit more real realistic in some ways but but regardless of of sort of getting into um the i don't know if i want to put your hands here we're gonna also like the politics like almost almost the um regardless of the um i can't find a link i wanted to do sorry uh, but but uh, regardless of sort of like the what's your what camp are you in for like do you think the future is going to be X Y Z do you think OpenAI should just control everything and you know uh, try to make this sort of AGI god or not and like or do you want to be more decentralized regardless of like like that's 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 a very important discussion to have on its own but but outside of that um, I think what I what I really enjoyed about the conversations and uh, particularly Dan's talk, but was less about the content and more about, um, it kind of brings me back to um, like my efforts on frontier mapping, uh, which, 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 uh, which is sort of this project on trying to discern trajectories of development in like academic fields of study. Um, and inform a goal from that effort is sort of how do we inform people coming into these spaces that that want that want to do things that are, you know, um, that have a, kind of a, an assistive tool or perspective lens on how do you look at past developments and then this massive future space. Like it's really hard across many different fields of study to understand where you know, what are influence of where things are going and like it takes a lot of time and even even citing sort of the expert writing stuff we've talked about in the past, you know, like like a large part of a, anybody's education or, or, or even like part of the PhD ideally, um, or in one sense, maybe like not just developing your own ideas, but understanding what existing ideas in literature have been. And then specifically, what are the people who are really shaping the conversation currently doing and how that 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 the people in that bubble are you know not static necessarily uh, but there's this moving target of what's in and out of that bubble of discussion and so 
in that sense, um, going back to Frontier Map for a bit, and, and then Adela's talk, um, I really appreciated, I could tell he has a bit of a, like, a, a psychology background, <laughs> because he was, he was trying to really articulate how do we think about destinations that we want to go in versus the sort of immediate instantaneous sort of bickering about where things go in, 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 you know, more, uh, I would say polemic senses or like, obviously there's any, you know, anything that's about like political and cultural and, 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 and power stuff is its own, that's, that's its own messy things. And I'm not saying that there's, yeah, there isn't. I don't really want to get into that right now, but it's more. I, I think there's a, a a sort of interesting takeaway from all this for me has been how do we get to talking about specific like destination spaces in different fields of study as opposed to just a method or a technique, but actually mapping out. It was a different angle for me to think about mapping where not just like trajectory avenue, but like a trajectory destination spaces. And I think that's something I'm gonna really try to incorporate into some parts of both frontier map work that I'm doing, and also some of the other projects too. Like, like there's a way to do that in cognition futures. Not, not so much saying, not in the sense of, oh, you know, I'm the sort of magical, you know, I have my Thanos club and I'm gonna snap my fingers and we're all gonna to go to this location because I decided that that's the right choice to make for this field of study to go to. But more, I think there's an art to almost demarcating um, demarcating the tension that I've mentioned before. Like the, I'll reference the Margaret Bowden book in the kind of 2007 year saying, okay, Margaret Bowden in her book about history of cognitive science basically said, yeah, kind of up until this point, you could really follow everything, and now you can't. And that's even like even more so like impossible now uh, with everything that's going on and, and the way the interesting merging that's happening with like AI um, and and big data and just the models and like and like there's there's sort of an impossibility to trying to grasp where things are going, um, and all the things about say. Um, you know, canonical progress in, in, in science is, is not, there aren't any many breakthroughs anymore. We've had this, we have talked about that a few weeks ago and saying, oh, well, maybe it's because there just isn't a cohesive, there's more and more and more fine grained discussion. And so, so like, how do you, how do you actually have interpret, interpretational tools for this as someone learning in these spaces and someone trying to have a career in these spaces, as someone, you know, trying to find their way? And I feel like there's, um, there's some interesting things on how to talk about that that I've, I've been exposed to this weekend in general. So I know there's a little bit of nebulous talk um, about different fronts, but I guess I'll, I'll summarize by saying interesting things to think about for Future Map and also some of the like mentoring um, programs and Joe Crowing here. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really curious to sort of get an opportunity to discuss some of that over the summer in the open source meetings too, because we always have a nice professional development there. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, and I'll, I want to more formally touch upon some other things uh, next time. All right, that's great. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, yeah, so Ajad had to leave. Thank you for attending. And Paola said, you know, about the long-term aspect of it. Because human life is relatively short and finite, people do not tend to have a long-term vision, which is true. And, you know, that's that's so, yeah, I think there are a lot of things we can talk about. I think over the summer, you know, in the open source meetings, there are a lot of parallels between open source development and some of these things you're talking about. But also in terms of in that AI space, you know, how, thing, how technologies develop and some of the priorities and, and things like that. So it's very good. And thank you for sharing on the uh, conference as well. Okay, so I want to get to the last things uh, for today. There is this paper on um, that actually uh, Morgan posted, I think, or maybe I posted, I can't remember who, 
but this is a paper on the Atlas of Exercise Induced Brain Activation in Mice. Mm -hmm. So this is a nice uh, data set. It's an atlas that covers like some data from mice that are being exercised. So they're exhibiting not only plasticity, neuroplasticity, but some uh, physiological indicators of metabolism and, and uh, the effects of exercise. Uh, so there, um, I'm not familiar with any of these authors, but let's go through the abstract. The abstract says there is a significant interest in uncovering the mechanisms through which exercise enhances cognition, memory, and mood, and lowers the risk of neurodegenerative diseases. So this is tied to disease states and, you know, sort of seeing how interventions can affect disease states. In this study, we utilized the force treadmill running and distance match voluntary wheel running. So they're collecting data on a number, you know, with a number of uh, experimental paradigms, coupled with light sheet 3D brain imaging and CFOS immunohistochemistry. So the CFOS aspect is, you know, we have these early, immediate early genes that get upregulated in response to exercise. We also have longer term plasticity, which we can probe using brain imaging. And so the, the mice are doing these different things in the experimental settings, and we're getting these measures. And so then they took those data and those, those uh, experimental uh, settings to generate a comprehensive atlas of exercise-induced brain activation in mice. So what they did was they took the mice, I guess they sacrificed them or they imaged their brains in some way. Um, they... So they wanted to see the effects of exercise on brain activity. We compared whole brain activation profiles of mice subjected to treadmill running with mice subjected to distance matched wheel running. So they were comparing the treadmill running and wheel running uh, in, in, you know, to see what kinds of effects those had. Male mice were assigned to one of four groups, an acute bout of voluntary wheel running, confinement to a cage with a locked running wheel, forced treadmill running or placement on an inactive treadmill. So these are four things where they're doing exercise in different ways versus not doing any exercise at all. And that's kind of our control. So immediately following the ex each exercise or control intervention, blood samples were collected for plasma analysis and brains were collected for whole brain CFOS quantification, which is this really immediate gene that's upregulated in response to exercise. And so our data set reveals 255 brain regions activated by acute exercise in mice, the majority of which have not previously been linked to exercise. So they found some new information here about areas that are upregulated during exercise. So typically what you would do is you would pick brain regions that you know are involved and in, implicated in exercise that should be implicated in plasticity. And we find from a whole brain atlas that you have many more sort of correlates potentially, and many more brain regions that show effects of this. We find a broad response of 140 regulated brain regions that are shared between voluntary wheel running and treadmill running. So these are two different types of exercises. There's this broad response that uh, covers both of these uh, different types of behaviors. Well, hey, Bradley, you... can you scroll down just a little bit? Yeah. Oh, sorry, scroll up a little bit. Oh, okay. Sorry. Just, just so we can see the title. Okay, there you go. yeah. The Thank Atlas you. of Exercise Induced Brain Activation. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is in molecular metabolism. And so, yeah. And so then you have this uh, uh, 32 brain regions are uniquely regulated by wheel running, and 83 brain regions uniquely regulated by treadmill running. So we can actually take the individual types of behavior and say that they're unique responses as well. In contrast to voluntary wheel running, horse treadmill running triggers activity in brain regions associated with stress, fear, and pain. So we have these other things that are like kind of behaviors that uh, get associated with these uh, specific types of activities. So the conclusions are, our findings demonstrate a significant overlap in neuronal activation signatures between voluntary wheel running and distance match force treadmill running but our analysis also reveals notable differences and subtle nuances between these two widely used paradigms. And so they have their data set at neuropedia.dk. 
And so if you look at their data set here, this is the Neuropedia. A mouse brain atlas for virtual neuroscience. So this is actually where they keep a lot of the, you know, they they posted their data. A lot of papers like this where they build an atlas, they usually have a, you know, something that's on the web. So we have different maps here. And so actually we can select some maps. So this is a coronal view of the mouse brain where we're cutting through at this point here. Uh, you can see the brain here. And then we have these different settings. So we can actually go through at different slices. So we're selecting a coronal slice down at the caudal end of the brain versus maybe at the rostral end of the brain. And you can actually see um, differences in, in sort of the section. And then what happens is you can actually, you can select a brain region or you can select a map. And I guess the groups are these exercise, forced exercise, voluntary, and some other things. Let's take voluntary exercise. So you can see here that there's activity across the brain. In this slice, the activity is here. In this slice, the activity is here. For, yeah, really yeah. And then for uh, if you want to look for forced exercise, it's a much different activation pattern. You can see on the right, you have more widespread activation. But in this slice, you have widespread activation across different regions. <laughs> So you can see the regions labeled here. I don't know if you can see the little uh, acronyms, but those are different brain regions. CA3 being uh, part of the hippocampus, mm -hmm. uh, CA1, and then other areas of the brain as well. So this, this is really nice because, you know, a lot of these atlases, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you collect a large amount of data and they kind of sit there in a paper. But when you build an atlas, you know, you can really kind of explore Things. And people use these for different experiments, or sometimes you can do like secondary analyses on these atlases. We can take these images and segment them and build models from that too. Um, but yeah, this is this is all great. Uh, so this is you know whole brain uh, data. So we have the whole mouse brain, and we have these different conditions, and you know the, of course the the. Uh, there have been different efforts at these different atlases. The Allen Institute has a brain atlas that really incorporates a lot of high density uh, molecular imaging and uh, neuroimaging as well, and like some electrophysiological imaging, and then mapping that onto the anatomy. So, uh, so Morgan, did you have anything? Because I know that's your kind of your area. <laughs> well, it, it, it's. Um... Uh, I, I hadn't looked at it too much, except the my my little snarky comment about <laughs> about forced. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That that this is my reaction to exercise, but uh, um, but really interesting. And and their conclusion is that there is a difference, or like like a really interesting molecular. Um, molecular differences that they're getting at between the the force task and the voluntary task right. which which you know wouldn't necessarily be a, a, a doesn't doesn't uh, it's not intuitive yeah. um, and um, you know this also gets it um, I mean to, to some degree this is also like the um, the kind of stuff that um, that we've seen recently where, it, you know, there's all this work on freely moving um, behavior uh, um, because or, or it, like, like even perceptual activity differs, uh, you know, and given the state, if you will, of the, the organism. So, you, you know, for a long time, we were looking at um, looking at perceptual neuronal activity of anesthetized animals and you know perhaps not as not as obvious or not as surprising but but that 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 there was actually remarkable differences between anesthetized where you, know, you still got the eyes open you still they're still receiving the same inputs but <clears throat> the activity is obviously really different Right now, this is this is I think more surprising because this is you know again voluntary, but um, uh, uh, 
Yeah, just just it, it gets at that importance of um, getting. I mean, just in humans, getting uh, uh, experimentation out of the lab, and you know, as 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 much as possible, and what what differences we would you know potentially see as well. Yeah, was, yeah. Uh, Paola had a question here. Uh, so what did we learn from the high density molecular data about the diversity of types of molecules? So in this atlas, they really only had the CFOS, I think, and they kind of just showed the distribution across the different conditions. So, you know, CFOS is, is this immediate early gene that gets upregulated in, directly in response to um, exercise. So like a lot of times you'll have atlases where they focus on gene expression in different areas of the brain, but not necessarily in response to like a behavior. So like the, the responses sometimes are due to cell type. So if you have a neuron in the brain and they, they make an atlas of it, they, they kind of assay those genes and the gene expression. And it's, you know, they can say, well, this is a certain type of cell because it's expressing these cell identity genes. In this case, there it's expressing this thing that responds right away mm -hmm. after you engage in exercise, and it, it triggers other genes mm -hmm. downstream. But those are somewhat noisy with respect to like kind of saying, what is the effect of exercise? Where is the activity? And so the immediate early gene is usually a marker that they use for that, just mm -hmm. to say, this is what's affected by exercise. This is where this cascade can be initiated. And you can get this, these other gene expression cascades that happen as a consequence of exercise, and they might be longer term. So we know that then we can say, if we look at the atlas, that there, you know, there's a certain widespreadness of the response. It could be like many regions of the brain. It could be like focused to certain regions of the brain and so forth. So that's a, what we kind of say about this. Uh, yeah. And then so more, or she had a question for Morgan or comment. So important understanding the chemistry of consciousness, if we mm. can get into that. Yeah, mm. I mean, there, there's a lot of things, you know, we, I mean, there are a lot of theories of consciousness, but there are ways you can say, you know, um, this is what's going on during this kind of free behavior. So that's like one path to like understanding how the brain is responding to behave like naturalistic behavior. So we have these naturalistic paradigms where we can do, I mean, this is still kind of a, a focused task for the mouse. It's running on a wheel or it's running on a treadmill, but it's not like you're, you know, kind of exposing it to a one shot thing. You might train it on this running over many, many training sessions and then get the data where uh, you, you look at the differences between like one marker and say, this is the effect of like long-term exercise versus like just exercising for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it really tells you like what, what, you know, what kinds of things not only would you get from like say a neuroimaging session where you say, you know, uh, look at this image or do this thing and what's the res immediate response, but like, what is the long-term response? What is the brain, you know, what happens when you train, when you have a training regimen or when plasticity is persistent over a long time? Yeah. And that can be quite different. And that leads us to some of these patterns and it may be consciousness. It may lead us to some sort of statement oh. about consciousness or maybe not. Um, and then Paola said, uh, Yes, well, they call a response of a state of being consciousness versus of being unconscious or unresponsive to the point about anesthetized the sleep specimen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah. and I know Morgan knows a lot about neuroimaging, especially in that domain. There's been a lot of work on like EEG and like looking at conscious states and things like that. Uh, yeah, and, and um, well, uh, just so you know, yeah, we're, we've been looking um, with Amanda. I've been looking at um, anesthesia on on EEG and and reading, you know, analysis papers on um, the neuroimaging of of other drugs that um, you know drug challenges uh, um, for altered states of consciousness. Um, and again, you know, see, seeing seeing what we can find across lots of these, right? So we we'll look at multiple drugs, we we'll look at multiple anesthesias, um, and um, yeah, 
very, very interested in the, the one in the algorithms that people use to to try to characterize that. So. That's okay. Yeah, so there's a lot of lot of work there. Um, yeah, so I think that that's just interesting. You know, look at these whole brain atlases and what people are doing, putting together data sets. And of course, we can use those data sets for biological modeling or for you know um, people use them to set up their own experiments where they kind of know where what kind where areas of the brain you might look for, you know, as as a response to exercise, and then they can assay more specific genes. <laughs> or other types of signals that would tell them what's going on. Yeah, I mean, this, that's what's really interesting about this is that, you know, this is so molecular, the kind of stuff that we, we would, don't normally get on humans, obviously. Oh, yeah. And um, um, it, it'd be interesting to put this together with kind of the, the um, Allen Institute you know, merging this with the Allen Institute uh, Atlas would um, probably be able to also say even even more in kind of the um, the way um, um, I think Bradley Voitek's group used the Allen Institute data to you know to to get look at particular brain regions, look at particular cell types in those brain regions, and then be able to um, yeah. Do a kind of meta analysis, not even using n new data, but um, that would be okay, kind of interesting. Morgan, to I need to thank you for your interest, and I do think it's uh, mind blowing, and one of the reasons why I started looking at it. But let me, um, I have to give a disclaimer. So, in the sense that I have um, met the head. Of Allen Institute at this conference, I was at a conference five years ago because I was looking at data models. I was trying to answer the question, what 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 data do we have about the brain, and what does it look like? So, being a little bit of an information technologist, of course, the first question I ask is how many data types, how many cell types. It was a natural question. It was not intended to <laughs> create this there, but at the time, and, and the neuroscience research has been going on for already 10, 20 years, but very high level. Um, the I don't remember the name of the character, and she was came into the you know, time name, and she replied, she was giving a keynote, excellent work, a great speech, and, and I said, hey, um, she said that we don't know yet, but we will know soon. And uh, five years later, so that's soon enough, well, uh, to November 2023, I saw a paper which said that uh, Allen Brain, uh, Allen Institute had finally identified 3,300 cell types. Have you seen that paper, Morgan? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. we, we, we talked about that, yeah. Okay, so I said, first thing, when I have a moment, I've got to go look at it. And when I went to look at it, it was mind breaking. Um, and because you had to use this fantastic, uh, very advanced uh, interfaces and tools for creating data, but you need to have a lot of knowledge to, to know what the data is inside before you can use it. So I wrote to the forum, I think it was James, the name of the guy, a couple of people answering on the forum, and they immediately responded saying, hey, you're right, here is the data, and then Kim, who's the author of the paper, and sent me the table, and I got the table. Table with 3,000 rows, and I don't know how many columns, maybe a dozen or so, and I'd be happy, very happy to share that. So my first task was, let's visualize that table as a mind map, so that because the main three elements of the, uh, of the table are supercluster, there are about uh, I don't remember, maybe 30 superclusters in there. Then there are clusters and then there are, other, there are subclusters. And at the moment, it's impossible to visualize that data as a, as a set, which is what I need, what I want to start from, to, to be able to do anything else. And I, I'm a little bit stuck there. So I will get you to help me more than if I may. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So this and is. And everyone. Important. Yeah. I will put it out as a task on the slide. So basically, I think we, you know, just we have the data, but 
I'm so glad that people are sharing, uh, appreciating their anxiety about not being able to yeah. process oh, yeah. it as a human. Uh, so let's start from that. Um, so I don't know much about the data yet, yeah. but the fact that we have the data of the human, well, actually it's the mammal brain. Yeah. Uh, so, but it's, you know, it's a start. I think it's a good beginning. So if yeah. we can put our heads together, maybe we can start getting insights. So thank yeah. you for the interest. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it it is it is. I mean, we we live in a, you know a remarkably interesting time in terms of the, the amount of data that's that's becoming available. Um, what we've talked about a little bit in previous meetings is that um, you, you know, a, as awesome as it is, um, it is it is um, it, 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 you know it's a it's a data size of a, a, an almost superhuman, <laughs> uh, um, you know, it defies, it defies organization in, in simple ways, uh, as well as the fact that the, the data that we really want is still um, located in multiple silos. You know, like, like it is awesome. Like, and I, and I think everybody who's, who's putting out their data is doing it, you know, in good conscience. Uh, um, but, um, you know, there is like uh, some interesting work um, trying to combine these, or, you know, in, in good ways or, you know, trying to make, um, yeah, just, just organizing, organizing data of this size and complexity um, especially when we don't kind of, you know, so this, this gets to kind of the, the, the developing, um, part perhaps more is that like, we don't know what drove all of this <laughs> in, in, in a, in a structural way. Um, or, you know, like, like we see lots of genes. We know that, that, that kind of widespread gene regulation and expression patterns change over time, you know, and, and like e even these kinds of, you know, snapshots don't get at, um, you know, all the kind of dynamism, dynamism in the, um, in, yeah, the gene expression over time, for instance. Um, but like absolute, super interested, you know, and this, is, and then combine and, and these other, you know, big systems biology meetings are exactly where I try. I try to stay up with, you know, what the what the molecular biologists and you know, phys oh sorry, okay, and the physiologists have have been trying to do right. Uh, um, you know, so I I, I try, you know like like um, the um, Allen Institute is great. You know, I, I try and stay up with like the the EMDL work at Biomodels, and um, and other um, yeah other big systems biology um, databases as well um, that I think will be really useful to combine with these kind of you know somewhat neuroimaging related data sets. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, we talked about some of these issues in the Diva One group as well. So uh, that's that's another place that we, we actually we talked about the number of cell types. And it's kind of like people have been making estimates on the number of cell types in both the human body and in the brain for years. And I think we're finally getting to the point where we have really good data on how to, you know, how to make that estimate. Because you know, previously it's really been kind of just guesswork or like very limited sparse data and making a statement about the number of cell types. And if you look historically, that number of cell types is like an order of magnitude and difference. So it's like, well, that's not helpful. So, you know, with these type of data, and, and again, you can run into the same problem if you have a lot of data where, you know, you don't know what the things that really define those categories are. And so you end up with these estimates that are really based on like, you know, I, this is my criterion, this is what the estimate is. Someone else's criterion might give you a different estimate, so you're no better off. 
but I think, you know, at least with the data, we have a starting point. So this is, this is a long-term interest, a, a topic of long-term interest. And so, yeah, please share that, those data. Um, that would be great. And yeah, so, um, well, thank you for meeting today. Uh, you know, I had, we had a great meeting and uh, talk to everyone next week. Thank you for attending and uh, yeah, bye. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye.